types of framing techniques used today. The first is platform framing or western framing. This is the most used um, technique in the industry today. The most important thing to remember about platform framing is that each level has its own set of studs. So your first floor will have studs coming off of your sole plate that lead up to your double header and then the process repeats with a new joist header and new subfloor, new sole plate, and then new studs on top of that. The second type of framing we will talk about is balloon framing, also known as eastern framing. The main difference between this and western framing are the studs and they run the entire height of the building. As you can see here, we have one floor that starts here and you have your second floor here. These studs do not go through this floor but butt up against it. So these joists and the fire stop butt up against the studs. Some of the advantages and disadvantages to this type of framing. Um, the advantages include it's easier to run electrical and plumbing up through the chutes, but that also is a disadvantage because it can um, help fire go to second floors. And another disadvantage is it's harder to assemble wall sections. Our third framing technique is plank and beam framing. Plank and beam framing is unique because the floor beams are actually larger than in other types of framing. This uh, makes the building more structurally sound and uh, the larger beams are actually higher grade. Span larger areas with plank and beam framing because the beams are larger pieces of wood. Some of the problems with using plank and beam framing is that the sheer size and grade of the uh, framing itself it tends to cost a lot more than just regular framing. So there's that. And then um, also, if uh, not treated properly, the beams tend to rot over time. The first type of wall framing we're going to talk about today is 16 inch on center. 16 inch on center refers to the width in between the centers of the boards. This type of framing is usually found in most residential homes and is what's used today in construction. The second type of framing we're going to talk about is 24 inch on center wood framing. This technique is generally used when you're trying to reduce the amount of lumber on a project. The 24 inches refers to the um, width between uh, studs from center to center. Twenty-four inch on center framing is also called advanced framing. The term advanced framing refers to the method of framing which uses two by six wood studs at that twenty-four inch on center to frame out both interior and exterior walls of a wood frame structure. Traditionally and historically, many wood frame buildings have been constructed using two by four wood studs at 16 inches on center, which, while sufficient in providing stable support of a structure, can be quite intricate because of the frequency of studs needed per framed wall. And it also inhibits the amount of insulation that can go in between stud and wall cavities. 24 inch on center walls are ideal for non load carrying walls. These are places like long stretches of hallways or places that avoid the hanging of millwork, such as cabinetry. Using 24 inch on center framing tends to save contractors and framers time and resources by reducing the overall amount of wood needed to not only frame the structure in question, but also to transport, store, and account for waste of that wood. The national average cost of a 2x4 stud typically falls around $1.90, whereas the cost of a 2x6 stud is closer to $3.70. This is an example of a 16 inch on center framed wall. When laying out the wall, you're going to take tape holder, measure 16 inches, make a mark, and then put an X on the other side of the wall, on the other side of your mark, for the uh, stud to go. If you have a window or door in your wall frame, you will remove the studs depending on the rough opening width. You will then place a king and jack stud on the left and right side of the window or door to support it, and you will have cripples on the top and bottom to support as well. Wood framing, while extremely popular amongst small-scale construction projects and contractors, is not necessarily suitable for all types of construction. What do contractors turn to in projects like mid- and high-rise buildings, or structures in seismically sensitive locations, like along the western coast of the United States, Building next to the San Andreas Fault? Not with wood, you're not. What about the areas around the world which fall under very hot and dry, or extremely wet and humid climates, ones which could be susceptible to wildfires or tropical storms? What kind of materials can be used in such locations and environments? The answer, steel.
Steel framing in the forms of cold form steel, or CFS, and carbon structural steel help alleviate a lot of the challenging strains associated with modern construction. From a structural standpoint, steel framing has a yield strength or pressure strength of 70 kips per square inch, or KSI. That's 70,000 pounds per square inch. Compare that number to the yield strength of pine, which is a common wood type used in wood framing at 5.8 KSI, and it can be quite clear to understand how structural steel can be a much more reliable and safe alternative to wood, especially in the high-rise buildings many skylines are now adopting. As for interior walls, which are often not load-bearing in a building with structural concrete, steel can be used for those too. CFS, that cold form steel I mentioned earlier, helps overcome several snags that come along with using wooden studs. For example, two CFS studs can fit inside the footprint of a single wood stud, and together, they still weigh one third less than a single wood stud does. This is due to their eye-shaped design. These two factors combined can make for cheaper shipping cost and more storage capacity per square foot on a job site where material storage can already be an extremely limited commodity. What's more, metal, unlike wood, doesn't wick moisture, and it's therefore not susceptible to mold growth or the warping that comes with wood as it absorbs and releases water. That's not only a great quality to have in case, say, your bathroom floods overnight or someone leaves a sink running all day, but it also helps eliminate wait time of having your wooden, waterlogged job site dry out after a heavy rainstorm during construction. It allows crews to work faster during the actual layout, assembly, rough-in, and finishing stages of interior wall construction. While steel studs can be prone to rust as a result of long exposure to moisture, the installation of a simple moisture or vapor barrier alleviates that issue. Now what about the complete opposite end of the severe weather spectrum? In the event of a fire, whether it be a wildfire or a horrible kitchen accident, steel studs are a lot less likely to burn down and can actually aid in the prevention and retardation of fire spreading from one room to the next. After a tragedy due to fire, this means a building or parts of buildings can still have their basic structure remaining strong, structurally sound, and ready to be built upon. This not only matters to say a family who lost their home in a California wildfire, but also to the neighbors of a person in a high rise apartment building who may not practice good fire safety in their day-to-day -day lives. Ever have to leave your apartment building in the middle of the night because someone caught their curtains on fire with a candle? I have. Our building was made with steel and had proper fire stops and fire caulking between the demising walls. Because steel has weather resistant properties like the ones I just outlined, steel stud walls can actually lead to significantly lower costs of flood and fire insurance by private insurance companies, making steel an attractive option to owners and contractors alike. The next type of framing we're gonna talk about is metal stud framing. This is traditionally used in larger commercial buildings and public venues. The idea behind metal stud framing is you have a track along the bottom and the top. You insert the metal stud into the track, and then you take metal stud crimpers and you crimp at the bottom and top. You then put your studs all the way along depending on your width, and you can add support braces in between um, to add structural support. Engineered studs can be broken into two categories, LSL and LDS. LSL is laminated strand lumber, while LDL is laminated veneer lumber. <laughs> Engineered studs can be thought of as OSB board. They're particles that are glued together. LDL is stronger than LSL, but costs more money. Engineered lumber has not been fully adopted in the residential construction industry. Some of the reasons include the cost and the weight of engineered studs. Engineered lumber is much heavier than regular lumber. Some of the pros of engineered lumber are that the boards are much straighter, you can make longer spans because it is much stronger, and it's much easier to work with because it's straight. Cross-laminated timber is a new type of construction engineering that uses wood planks stacked in alternating directions and then pressed together using resins and different types of epoxies and bonds to create a structural solid piece of wood that is used for walls, floors, and roofs. One advantage of cross-laminated timber is that it's lighter than concrete. This can mean you have less site work on your construction site. Additionally, laboratory tests have proven that CLT is just as strong as concrete and steel. The wood also acts as an insulator 
um, whenever you're building your house so you don't have to put as much insulation into your building. Cause of CLT include that they're mostly prefabricated pieces and design issues cannot be fixed as easily as with wood studs. Possible maintenance could be required because CLT is made of wood and it is a much higher initial cost than other products. We're going to talk about some of the common terms you might hear on a construction site in relation to wall framing. The first one is a trimmer or jack stud. This is what supports the header from underneath on both sides. The king stud surrounds the header to add extra support. <clears throat> and then on the bottom you have extra support with your cripples that sit underneath your sill. Insulation is arguably one of the most important parts of a house that cannot be compromised. Insulation is what keeps the heat in your house and the cold out. Or conversely, in the summer, insulation keeps AC costs down by preventing the transfer of heat from outside air to internal conditioned air. Thermal imaging truly shows the difference insulation can make in your house. As you can see in the pictures, even with insulation in the wall cavities, you can still see the heat dissipation at the floor level. The second picture shows the temperature difference for the entire face of the house. One side is completely insulated while the other side is uninsulated. The winner clearly stands. 16 inch on center framing was chosen for the house on Vine Street because of its economic viability, accessibility, and effectiveness. The new Chauncey Neighborhood Association is encouraging family homes to be built in the area and the typical framing style for residential homes is 16 inch on center. Newer machining processes like planing lumber, cutting tongue and groove, and turn cutting logs for plywood plies changed how framing was done. Plywood, more than anything, made centering on four and eight foot increments and made 16 and 24 inch centers popular, since either distance ensures there is a stud at the center of each break in the material. For residential applications of plywood paneling, half inch gypsum wallboard, or other less rigid wall materials, using 16 inch on center gives a more solid flat wall. Presently, to comply with wind loads, roof loads, and other code issues, exterior walls are framed at 16 inch on center, often with 2x6 studs that allow for more insulation in the cavity and for more structural strength. 